How many of you have heard of Fortnite? If you have, could you please raise your hand? Wow, a lot of people. So, for the people who don't know what it is, it is basically an online battle royale type video game where 100 players drop onto an island and they aim to be the last one standing on the island by trying to eliminate each other in several ways. So, I own an account like other 125 million account holders the game currently has. And to be honest, playing Fortnite on my console is one of the activities that I'm fond of doing in my spare time. Before Fortnite or any other battle royale type video games, there were only a limited number of games that could be played online. And the, numbers, uh, and the number of people playing the game at the same time could only reach up to 10, meaning that it was certainly difficult to connect and play online video games with your friends, and that you were forced to play against the artificial uh, intelligence engine inside the game. But how did the gaming sector have such a drastic change? How did playing against five up to 10 people with internet speeds that couldn't rise over four megabytes per second turn into 100 players playing the same game at the same time with internet speeds over 20 megabytes per second? We as gamers owe this change to the rise of computing power in our consoles and to the constant rise of internet speeds in the last 10 years. Countries like South Korea now have an internet average of 26 megabytes per second. Physical devices you see on today, your cell phones, your tablets, your home security systems, home appliances, all need to be connected and to each other and to a network so that they can exchange data at all times, uh, resulting in the need of higher internet speeds. Their data exchange is inevitable and genuinely favorable, considering that it aims towards efficiency at all times. So now, let me briefly, ex uh, sorry, an operative efficiency. We owe this change, we can summarize all of these ex data exchange under two massive headlines, which are the in Internet of Things and Industry 4.0. So now let me briefly explain to you the past industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution dates back to 1765, with the discovery of steam and water powered machines being used in the textile industry. This can be classified as the first step in mechanization. The second industrial revolution is dated between 1870 and 1914, where factories first met electricity, and this can be considered as a first step in industrialization. Also, Henry Ford can be given as an example, as he used electricity-powered factories to manufacture, sorry, man, not produce his Ford Model T. The third industrial revolution is dated between 1970 and can be considered as the first, can be considered as the first automation wave in history. Electronics and IT were on a rise and they were being used in factories. So now, the moment we've all been waiting for, what is Industry 4.0? Well, actually, the fourth Industrial Revolution was theorized by Klaus Schwab, who was the previous head of the World Economic Forum. The name actually originates from a project conducted by the German government and was first revealed in the Hanover uh, 2011 fair. And the project proposed aimed to promote the computerization of manufacturing. Industry 4.0 also hosts on what can be called a smart factory, where cyber-physical systems make decentralized decisions whilst monitoring the process happening within the factories. These cyber-physical systems, uh, sorry, these cyber-physical systems located in the smart factories have the capability of connecting and cooperating with each other so that they can result in efficiency. Then there's a question raised. Are all cyber-physical systems adequate enough to be located in the smart factories or turn the factory they operate into into a smart factory? What principles must a smart factory's cyber-physical systems have in order for it to be considered a smart factory? Well, Klaus Schwab actually addresses all of these concerns in his published theory and states the four basic principles that a smart factory must have in order for it to be considered a smart factory. These four principles are Inoperability, machines, devices, sensors, and people connecting with each other and uh, with each other and to a network using the data uh, internet of things. Information transparency, the ability of information systems to create a virtual copy of the physical world by enriching digital models with data coming from sensors. Technical assistance, the ability of assistance systems to agree the ability of assistance systems to support humans by aggregating and visualizing data comprehensively so that urgent problems could be solved on a short notice. Decentralized decisions, the ability of cyber-physical systems to make decisions on their own and perform their tasks as autonomously as possible. However, with any major change or adaptation process comes challenge. And in this case, there are some challenges that need to be dealt with while adapting to an Industry 4.0 model. These challenges are, Sorry, these challenges are data, of data security issues, achieving and maintaining a high level of reliability and stability, 
maintaining a product process with less, with less human oversight, loss of high-paying human jobs, and also a systematic lack of experience and manpower to create and implement these systems. Although all of these challenges exist, yet the benefits of adapting to an Industry 4.0 model could actually overweigh all of these concerns. Only 8% of tasks are currently automated in factories today, while this number is estimated to rise to 25% in just a span of 10 years, with the contribution, of course, of the cyber-physical systems located inside the factories. Nevertheless, a question still remains. Now that we know how smart factories are considered smart factories, we still don't know where they will be located or how they will operate. Actually, the answer is not far away. With the macroeconomic shift that will come with Industry 4.0, manufacturing will be more flexible and will be located in home markets. In before Industry 4.0, mankind had actually attempts to turn the economy around. They tried to specialize factories by product, they tried to locate factories offshore to take advantage of cheap labor, and they also tried to make factories big, uh, larger so that a product with a high demand could be sold instantly to customers. Now, with Industry 4.0, all of these uh, attempts have become obsolete and they were never sustainable. With Industry 4.0, factories were located in home markets, as I addressed before, due to autonomy and less human contribution being needed. Factories need to be close to customers, because what matters in Industry 4.0 is not stockpiling the same product for each and every customer. The manufacturing world doesn't work this way anymore. Consumers should be able to get the exact same product with the desired design, desired functionalities. With the, uh, without any additional cost and with the same b delivery period as uh, other products. Also, customers, uh, consumers in the 21st century, century want their products to be delivered to them as fast as possible. Attention spans of post millennials don't go above eight seconds, meaning that if us, as a post millennial, want to buy something off online, we have to make our decision in less than eight seconds. And a post millennial wants some product to be delivered to them as fast as they can, or in 24 hours. Meaning, uh, so, sorry, 24 hours or less. Amazon currently offers 24-hour shipments with subscriptions such as Amazon Prime. Amazon can also be given as an example as a company which uses cyber-physical systems av as they have used cyber-physical systems to ship all products across the U.S. during the peak of online retail, Cyber Monday. On the other hand, Industry 4.0 is much more than product efficiency. It's about producing more exceptional, more smarter products. It's about customization, like I addressed before. Everyday objects such as clothes, cell phones, vehicles, and much more should be customizable. In the US, the movement of Industry 4.0 has also spread to the health sector, where clients can get specially designed 3D casts for themselves. And because the cast is a perfect fit, the cast could be printed with empty spaces inside, which are not crucial to the healing of the bone, so that the cast could actually get fre so that the skin under the cast could actually get fresh air. Not only do we see effects of Industry 4.0 in the health sector in the U.S., but Industry 4.0 has also affected companies which are operate on different sectors, but all rely on a use of ha heavy data exchange. Companies like Uber, Alibaba, and Airbnb. We can say these companies are data exchange companies. Uber, the world's largest ta taxi company, doesn't even own a single taxi. Alibaba, the world's largest online shopping company, doesn't even own a single warehouse. Airbnb, the world's largest tourism company, doesn't even own an apartment. They all sell their services and earn money off the service they provide. So, during my research that I was doing at the time to write my TED Talk, I came across an already delivered TED Talk, which was two years old. The speaker proposed that Industry 4.0 was actually in our pockets and we just needed to be aware of it. He said that we could actually use our knowledge and time better so that we could spread the knowledge we had to other people who didn't even have the basic access to it. He said that entertaining yourself with technology, scrolling down on your Instagram feed, watching videos from YouTube were all things that were inevitable, but they shouldn't be considered as our priority number one. For example, Half of the world today doesn't even have basic access to healthcare, meaning that half of the world cannot walk into a doctor's office and get the necessary medication and treatment they need. We need to use our time and effort to pro solve problems as such. For example, as of last year, Facebook used, started using solar-powered drones as Wi-Fi transmitters to submit Wi-Fi to places, villages in Africa which don't have any Wi-Fi connection. We are the people who can have an impact on the world. Each one of us could utilize their time better and try to spread the knowledge they have gained through their resources. I would like to end my speech by a quote from Kristen Louis Lang. He said that, technology is a good servant but a dangerous master. So let's master technology before technology masters us. Thank you. Thank you.